the intro as people are still coming in. So welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on and attending this evening's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am a programming librarian here at Cary. Uh, before we begin, please let me know in the chat if there are any technical issues that I can try to resolve. If you have any questions or comments for tonight, please send them via the Q&A and we'll address them at the end. Um, if you do not want to see chat previews while the pro program is going on, uh, there should be an arrow next to the chat button uh, where you can click hide chat previews. I'd also like to thank the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation for helping make programs like tonight's possible and Lexington Living Landscapes, the host of tonight's program. Tonight is part of an ongoing series of presentations where the library is partnering with Lexington Living Landscapes to bring in experts on landscape and conservation issues to the public. So now from Lexington Living Landscapes, I'd like to welcome Charlie Wyman. Thank you, Matt, and good evening, everyone. We're delighted you can join us tonight. I'm, as Matt said, I'm Charlie Wyman of Lexington Living Landscapes. And for those of you not familiar with us, we're a local volunteer initiative that launched a couple of years ago to encourage more sustainable landscaping practices in town. More native plants, fewer invasives, fewer chemicals, more trees, more trees. Uh, we have a website and newsletter and undertake a variety of uh, projects, including online programs like this in partnership with Cary Library. You can learn more about us at our website, lexingtonlivinglandscapes.org. And uh, from there, you can sign up for our newsletter. Let me extend a big thank you to Matt, Cary Library, and the Cary Library Foundation for hosting this evening's program. Let me also give a shout out to everyone who's attending from other towns. Welcome. Uh, and to our co-sponsors who helped spread the word about the program, the Arlington Tree Committee, Bedford Arbor Resources Committee, the Lexington Tree Committee, Lexington Friends of Trees, and the Wellesley Conservation Land Trust, as well as the other tree advocates and advocacy organizations in the region who shared news of tonight's program. Let's get down to business. In a minute, I'll introduce our speaker, Dave Bloningarts. Um, and after his presentation, Dave has agreed to field questions that I'll put to him from among those you send in, and we'll get to as many as we can. As Matt explained, if you have a question for Dave, please put it in the Q&A, not the chat. I can barely walk and chew gum at the same time. And um, for me to listen to the talk, watch the Q&A, and the chat at the same time is just too much. So please use the chat only for sharing thoughts with each other. And if you find it distracting, as Matt explained, you can hide it. I'm very excited about this evening's presentation and eager to hear what Dave has to share with us. Dave Bloniarts is a research scientist with the US Forest Service. He is the project coordinator of the Urban Natural Resources Institute, which aims to bring research findings, state-of-the-art tools, and new technologies to users across the world. He holds a master's degree in landscape architecture and a doctorate in urban forestry from the University of Massachusetts. He is a member of the Forest Service's iTree development team and is an adjunct professor in the UMass School of Earth and Sustainability. Dave, thank you for joining us this evening. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Charlie, and uh, thank you, Matt, and thanks for the, uh, the entire team down in Lexington and the associated uh, towns that are making this possible. When Charlie called me, he, um, he asked me if I wanted to talk about the value of trees, and I said, well, you know, if you know me, I could talk about trees forever. And so he said, no, you got to limit it to um, just a little bit of time and, and, and try to uh, focus. So that's what I'm going to try to do today. One of the neat things about being on Zoom is <laughs> that uh, I can't see the expressions on your face. So I don't know if I'm telling <laughs> you or making you guys smile or laugh or anything. Um, but you also, um, and, 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 and so that's the difficult side. The other side is that you have the opportunity to type in some questions that will be archived and then Charlie will be able to, um, and I can try to answer some of the questions the best I can. If I can't answer them, I'll, um, we'll keep those and I'll get, um, uh, I'm going to give you a website later you can go to and I can put in some other resources that may come up from your questions. So don't look at this as just a presentation on, on the value of trees or the importance of trees or something. Look at it as the first steps that you might take or continued steps in examining the value of trees in your own community. Um, so I'm really excited to be in uh, Lexington. I've 
some of my family actually, I, I spent a lot of time as a kid in Lexington. The family lived on uh, Revere Street, and um, I still have a few relatives uh, living in Lexington. So it's not a new town to me, and it was always exciting to uh, visit in Boston and um, head over to Lexington after we visited my grandma down in Brighton. So that's a long time ago, as you can tell, I'm not a youngster. So, um, but let me get started. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have a PowerPoint presentation. And I know I hate to use PowerPoint, so we're probably going to go live over to the iTree website to show you a couple tools from iTree, which is one of the tools I'm going to talk about. But let's get started. I'm going to share my screen right now, and let's see if this works. And Matt will tell me, or Charlie, can you just shake your head if you can see the full screen? Uh, looks great, Dave. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. So um, uh, we put a title together, Charlie and I sat down and we said, let's um, go on beyond the beauty, okay? Because one of the things we all are tree lovers, or many of us are, and um, even the folks that aren't tree lovers, they understand the beauty of a tree, that it's, a, you know, nature's a little gift to us in a variety of ways throughout the seasons, throughout its growth, throughout its lifespan, and even as it um um, it, it moves on in senescence and dies. We still have the impacts and the value of what trees can do to rejuvenate the soils and things like that. So we're going to look a little beyond the beauty, though, and we're going to look at the uh, value of urban and suburban trees. And the reason I'm including suburban is because um, it really is, if we're in Massachusetts, a lot of our communities, we call them urban, yet the majority of the town is set up almost in a suburban type setting. So some of the tools I'll show you here can be applied to the densest area in, in we were talking earlier about in Manhattan, all the way out into uh, the, the, the widest um, forested landscapes of the Berkshire. So don't let the name fool you, but the idea is to look at forests of all type. And hopefully the ideas that I can get across will be related to that. Let's see if my slides move forward. Okay, so if you write this down or um, you're gonna be getting a, a note from Matt tomorrow with the recording and the link. I'll have this link in there too, but if you go to uh, www.unri.org slash resources slash Lexington, um, there'll be a bunch of resources there. The PowerPoint will be there. There'll be links to other sites and things like that. UNRI is my, um, the Urban Natural Resources Institute. It's the, um, uh, I work for the urban, um, for the, uh, an urban forester with the US Forest Service. And UNRI is um, one of our urban outreach uh, research um, components. So that's where that name comes from. So I just want to zoom in quickly here and, and tell you what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. So today I'm going to look at using science because I'm a scientist and I, I think I'm a scientist. And um, when I talk to some of the smartest, the brightest people that I work with, and I get to work on a regular daily basis with universities around the world, with our U.S. Forest Service team of researchers, our professional and commercial partners. Um, we're scientists and, and we have some of the best brains that are working on trying to improve the uh, quality of our urban and suburban landscapes around the world. And so we're trying to use the science that they've developed to establish the benefits and values of trees. So we're going on just the value, the, the, the beauty of a tree and going and looking at those benefits. What are trees doing from an environmental from an ecosystem standpoint, and what are they doing to uh, address global climate change, community resiliency, and sustainability? I'm not going to talk to you about the replacement value for an individual tree. So we probably have a lot of lawyers living in Lexington um, that have probably been involved in tree cases where we um, have to replace a tree because of damage or trespass or things like that. And so we have some tools that we do that with, and I'll quickly explain those, but I, we're going to go beyond just the replacement value of an individual tree. And we're going to use science to establish the, the, the really the benefits and tie it into the value. So when we look here, the replacement value for an individual tree right there on the right is something we can look at this, we can say it has X dollars in value from a replacement standpoint. Um, if it was damaged because someone came in and trespassed or cut it down or it wasn't on their property or we need to replace it because we're going to build a, a brand new expansion of the library right there, um, someone really be, should be looking at the value of that tree and looking at someone needs to sort of compensate somebody and whoever that might be for the replacement of that tree. 
So we've developed uh, over the years our, our arborists and our International Society of Arboriculture, the Council for Tree and Landscape Appraisals. Um, they've developed a, a method for determining trees' value. And so this um, in the uh, in the um, resource that I gave you actually is tree bulletin number 28 from the National Arbor Day Foundation's uh, Tree City USA bulletins. And in there, it talks about the location of a tree, um, the size of the tree and the species of tree. And when we talk about the location, it's the site where it's growing, the tree condition, the contribution of that tree to the landscape and where it is placed you know, in a front yard or a backyard. And so that um, that document there for uh, homeowners, lay people, and even scientists, it provides us. So, oops, sorry about that. Uh, let's see. Um, it provides us some of the um, actual calculations and things that we use to determine the value of a tree. And so what I was saying, we're not going to go there today. And I, I goofed up, and I had another slide that had some of those calculations just to confuse ourselves. But we're not going there, and we're going to look at urban forests and tree canopy. And if you look here, you'll see that one there is in, in Brooklyn, New York. So we're going beyond just replacing a single tree, but what are these trees doing from an environmental ecosystem standpoint, sustainability standpoint, resiliency, and what are they doing to address global climate change, urban heat islands, and things like that? Here's one in Brookline, um, and, and Brookline is near and dear to my heart because that's where I did my research. Uh, working on my uh, doctorate, um, looking at the utilization of citizen scientists and collecting data on trees like these. But there's Brookline, and you can see the importance of, of trees here, cooling the pavement, cooling the buildings, reducing energy use, providing uh, wildlife habitat, providing a sense of place, doing all the things trees do in the landscape, and, and really a beautiful setting here, as beautiful as any city in the, in, or town in the country, or the world for that um, sake. Here's the back bay of Boston. Again, these are familiar to folks in the Boston area. I know you're in Lexington, but I know you get down to the big city and uh, experience these type of uh, settings. Some of you may have grown up in these kind of settings here, but you're getting the idea here of how trees um, have more than just an aesthetic value. Just by the shade on the street right here, you can see what this does on an 80, 90 or higher degree day, how that little bit of cooling, look at the shade on the building. So we can start to calculate those values. There's one from Lexington, okay? So we're looking more at the uh, forested or suburban landscape that I talked about earlier. And you can see that it's uh, really a, 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 an urban forest. We're living in an urban forest in most of the cities in Massachusetts, even when we're in a Boston, a Springfield, a New Bedford, Lowell, Lawrence, Pittsfield. Um, and then here again in Lexington, and Charlie and I were talking earlier about some of the streetscape renovations and using some innovative techniques there to keep these trees alive, to improve the ability of them to respond to changes with um, a, a local urbanized flooding, higher temperatures, um, traffic, uh, compaction, all the different things that you have here. But can we put a value on these trees and how important are those? And you can see from my um, economic standpoint here, what they do to create a more uh, inviting uh, commercial district downtown. And I, I just think that's pretty cool. And then here's another one over in Wellesley. I know we have um, Wellesley Tree Committees on here. And um, I just want to show you that's at Wellesley College. But again, you can see we are living in a forest. And really, it's kind of interesting because we know the value or we know that we like the trees, we love the trees. And how do we value the trees is what we're trying to look at um, with some of the things I'm going to show you in a second. Let's see if my slide is frozen. So here we are looking at Boston. That's an aerial uh, 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 Landsat photo, actually, of, of, excuse me, of Boston. You can see the harbor and you can see the airport right out here. You can see as we go up and then we go up into the, uh, you know, Lexington and Concord and out toward Framingham and beyond. And so you can see the pink represents areas that we consider urbanized and that's where the heat signature comes out but um within that we have trees and and green space and um localized park settings and things like that so all of this really combines for that urban experience here's hartford connecticut the connecticut river here some of you are familiar with that and then we go out to litchfield hills 
and and then we have over here more forested landscape. So the idea is we start to look at our cities. There's Worcester. Some of you are familiar, might be from Worcester. You can see that dense urban core. And so we want to look at the values that we can place on those trees. And one of the things is we're losing a lot of trees. We have, um, whether it be for new construction from disease and insects, from uh, construction damage, from um, uh, vehicular traffic in urbanized areas, from vandalism, from a variety of different standpoints, we have um, that urban forest. And so how do we assess something like this that was just cut down on a, uh, in a residential uh, condominium uh, parcel here? And so how do we value that? Well, let's go back to our Tree City Bulletin here. And you'll see, if you just look at the drawing here that's inside the uh, document, you'll see the IRS has no value on the tree. The insurance company says it's worth $500. The arborists say it's worth $2,500. And the owner says it's worth $5,000. Well, we have these ways to do it. And that's what placing the value with the uh, formulas that are right on the next page here. And you'll see we have the factors that I showed you a little bit earlier, but we have the replacement cost method and we have a trunk formula method. So if you grab the uh, Tree City Bulletin, you can start to look at this. And that's how we would look at a price to replace that tree that was just cut down. But I, as a researcher and as an urban forester, and I have a, um, a, a sort of a, um, well, I have a master's in landscape architecture. So I'm looking at things from that aesthetic side of things. And then with my science background, I'm looking at things from that ecosystem services, the environmental services that a tree provides. So I look up at a canopy and I say, what is that doing? Well, one thing it's helping me to uh, have less exposure to full sun with skin cancer and things like that, but it's also cleaning the air. It's providing cooling. The little wildlife habitat is here, you know, birds and other critters that use this as their habitat and a variety of other things. So how do we start to calculate that? Well, one tool that I want to introduce you to that I've been working on with the Forest Service for a few years is um, called iTree. And iTree is an acronym for the Inventory of Tree Resources, Economic and Environmental. Okay, and the idea is it's a suite of tools that assess urban vegetation and their ecosystem services and values. So there we are, we're getting to the sort of heart here, looking at the value of what a tree provides, okay? And what in a scientific ma manner can we use to calculate that value rather than just saying, oh, it looks nice or it's beautiful or it's part of the landscape, which really is sort of an intrinsic feeling we have toward it, but it's hard to put a dollar value on that. And that's why, when you saw that group of people all saying it's worth X dollars, well, it's hard to quantify it. And what we're trying to do here through science is to give you something that you can quantify this with over time. And so within iTree, we have a series of tools and there's a few here I'm gonna introduce you to today. Um, you don't need to worry about the names now, I'll show you the website and you can go and look at these, but each one of these is a different component of iTree. And any one of them is going to provide you information that you can use, whether you're a tree board, an advocacy group, a, a student, a professional, a city manager, or a researcher. Each one of these will provide you information that you can take and utilize as a, uh, a, a really a, a component of what work you are doing. And it represents a public-private partnership. It's kind of cool. We were one of the first within the Forest Service to actually partner with some private folks, and this was encouraged. Uh, um, our bosses are the executive branch, the president. So uh, we've been encouraged since uh, Bill Clinton was president to uh, start to work in more public-private partnerships. And it's really bode well for the Forest Service. So we're working with Davey uh, Tree Expert Company. We're also working with the National Arbor Day Foundation, which many are familiar with, the Society of Municipal, Municipal Arborists, the International Society of Arbor Culture. And then KC Trees is um, one of the, um, it's a tree advocacy group in Washington, DC. They're the uh, most endowed uh, uh, tree foundation in the country. They received a $40 million endowment from uh, a woman who read an article on the 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 plight of the trees in Washington, D.C., and she left a cool $40 million for them to start KC Trees. 
And so they wanted to partner with us. We didn't approach them. They approached us and said, hey, we want to help. So we've been able to try a lot of our work down there. So iTree, we like to say, is putting U.S. Forest Service science into the hands of users. And so I work for the Forest Service. And so I'm trying to help you tonight by trying to put a few tools and ideas in your heads that you might be able to take. One of the things over the last year, I've been working on um, iTree internationally. We just completed a uh, iTree Academy with folks from 26, 26 different countries around the world. So iTree isn't just something you're gonna find to be able to be used in Lexington. We also use it in Cairo, Bangladesh, in, in um, Perth, Australia, and in, 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 um, New Zealand and Brazil and all, a whole host of countries including um, we actually have folks working in the Ukraine that have uh, continued to attend the academy despite um, the troubles that were going on with the invasion of their country. And they're still focused on what they can do to improve the tree situation in Kiev. So it's just a powerful thing when people are so um, really attached to the green space, the trees and the ecosystem in their community. So iTree is a benefits-based approach. So what do we look at? The benefits that are provided. It's based on peer-reviewed scientific research by our scientific team at the Forest Service and our university partners. We, I guess it's 15 years um, that we've been doing it. It seems to me like it was just yesterday we started it, but I've been on the design team or the development team since day one. And in fact, I was lucky enough to um, name it iTree because my bosses had some long government name for it. And I said, let's name it iTree. And then all of a sudden we got a cease and detest order from Apple because I with the small I is trademarked and copyrighted. So that's why there's a dash in the name iTree. So Apple's happy, we're happy, and there you go. So our website is itreetools.org. So that'll be in the resources, but I'll show you that in a little bit that you uh, may want to take a look at because that's where the tools you can um, grab from there. I'm not going to get into all this because I don't want to run out of time, but the idea is that we can help you to uh, plan and manage your forest resources strategically so they can help to uh, serve the citizens, but also to address those things like climate change and resiliency, sustainability, um, public health and stormwater management. And then we support advocacy efforts with data. Um, you know, uh, Charlie was telling me about uh, trying to get some more promotion of the importance and value of trees in Lexington. Well, we're trying to support the advocacy efforts like that through data and with science and true data that is representative of scientific research, um, it speaks for itself. And then we're trying to improve preservation of trees and forests. And then the other thing is just to connect urban and rural forest importance so that people understand that trees in, in Lexington are the same kind of benefit you get from them from a psychological standpoint, from health-wise, are the same as you're gonna get if you go to the White Mountains or the Green Mountains or out West. So the connection between uh, urban and rural forests is something we try to promote because we are at a forest service and Smokey the Bear and everything. I'm one of the few forest service employees that gets to work in urbanized areas. We only have about uh, 40 of us that are working specifically in urbanized areas and the rest of us are working on, on forest uh, lands and, and, and in both the US and around the world. So iTree, economic opportunities, how do we uh, can uh, use trees to attract and retain business and residents? How can we promote green tourism and investment, create green industry jobs, sustainable development, youth engagement and education, and then develop new um, relationships and partners through iTree, through information. So here's just our little vision. Um, iTree improves forest and human health and forest and city resiliency through easy to use technology, engages people globally in enhancing forest management. So here's just a few things that we've done. The one down in the bottom is in uh, Springfield, Mass, where we have uh, tree value tags placed on, on trees that people can see. Milwaukee, um, we were pressing, we were pushing the uh, healthful benefits of, of, of trees. And then the Arbor Day Foundation is looking at energy. So you'll see, uh, we can use trees for a variety of different um, uh, promotions of ideas and concepts and um, uh, improvements to our ecosystem, our own personal health, and the well being of our community. 
So how do was how does iTree work and how does this whole thing um, uh, work together? I, 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 I'm just looking over at Nate Morell who joined us here and I see him a little dozing off. So I hope that you're not dozing off here. So um, I know I tend to ramble. So uh, Charlie, you promised you'd interrupt if this got too boring. So I'm gonna assume that you're still listening and you're uh, learning a couple things. And now you're gonna learn a little bit more as we go. But how do you estimate the tree benefits? So we look at air pollution removal. Okay, we know trees will, uh, I'll show you a few slides in a minute. Carbon storage and carbon sequestration. Avoided runoff from storms. So the hydro hydrologic effects. Energy use. Can trees save uh, cooling and heating? And I'll show you what that means here in New England. And then a structural assessment, what they do for the landscape as far as carbon storage and, and what they do as far as uh, um, being a part of wherever you are living or uh, recreating in or places like that. So just that structural element of them being a presence. Uh, the dollar value of the ecosystem services. And then again, those public health benefits that we look at. So one of the coolest things about this whole thing that we use is it's looking at trees and what makes up a tree. So one thing that we look at is the age of a tree, but then we also look at the leaf area of a tree. Okay, so in the top right, you can see a leaf that has, it's a, 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 it's a maple. You see the larger leaf area and then down below, it's a honey locust, which has small leaf area index. And so from science, we're able to combine a leaf area index with some other uh, components of the tree along with its size, its age, its, its age class distribution, and then those urban forest benefits as it shows it goes up here based on a taller tree with a larger leaf area index or a larger leaf, more benefits are provided. So that's why it's so important that we protect and try to keep alive our older trees because they're providing a lot more benefits than newly planted trees. Now, keep in mind, we want to plant new trees, but they're eventually going to get older, but we want to look at how we can get the most benefits out of these, uh, what population we have. And so you're looking at the larger trees, generally the more benefit that they're providing. So we're quantifying the tree benefits with scientific research. Here's one we did in Pittsburgh, where we looked at for every dollar invested in the community's trees, we showed a $2.94 benefit, okay? And that's using the data, looking at the energy use, carbon storage, air quality, stormwater, all the things I just talked about. And we're able to do that. And then we're able to look at an individual tree like this one on the right and show that this tree will provide us over $2,100 worth of uh, uh, benefits over the next 15 years, okay? So this is the only kind of infrastructure, and we call it green infrastructure, that increases in value over time. So, you know, the, you know I'm looking at the, uh, the Cary Library and you see the beautiful building with the stonework and the brick and all of that. Well, the minute that was finished, it begins to lessen, I mean, in, in concept, it begins to lose value because things get worn out. You know, the, the, the floors need to be replaced eventually, the door handles break and all these kinds of things. It starts costing money over time, whereas trees, they increase in value. And on the right here, it just shows us at the, um, on the, the top side, the structure, what do we have? On the right, the function, turn it into dollars and cents, the value, and how does that fit into our whole management regime? Um, and so this scientific research, we work with university partners, commercial practitioners, um, planners, students, citizen scientists, all work together to really be the um, eyes and ears and the engine that drives iTree, because we're always adding new data and new modeling into it. And so as we go through this, you want to look at how is your urban forest challenges and what are the opportunities that you face in Lexington, in Bedford, in, in Fall River, in New Haven, wherever it might be. And in this case here, you know, with, um, we have this is storm damage up in, in Vermont. You can see down below a tornado came through in Springfield and how this fits into the, the future with clean action, clean air um, and energy environmental uh, planning. So the foundation for what you value a tree or a forest or an, um, a collection of trees is we use a local inventory or sampling. We take weather, pollution, environmental variables, 
and we go through some hourly simulations. So that first slide was in Los Angeles. Here's Minneapolis, where we've done a lot of work. And then this one here is in Holyoke, Massachusetts, America's first planned city, along with uh, Lowell, where America's first planned city is on the canals. But um, these all have used iTree to help them to develop um, uh, strategic planning as they move toward um, making the cities more livable. So here's one of the benefits. So we look at Trees, we know they can absorb pollutants through the leaf surfaces, ozone, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and we can calculate that using some of the tools I'm going to show you in a second. We can intercept dust and particulate matter, um, 10 microns and uh, 2.5 microns and smaller, and so we know those are the ones that get into your lungs. And then we can, uh, reduction in energy production, because we can cool your house, you use less electricity, and that means less emissions back at the uh, generation plant. So that helps on global climate change as well as air quality. And then this just shows you an example here in Springfield. We did a little study a couple of years ago, a 15 oak, uh, 15 inch oak tree at 20 years. Um, we're collecting uh, nitrous dioxide, sodium dioxide, particulate matter. All of these are actually calculated um, using the iTree tool. So you can see over a 20 year period what they're doing. Uh, reducing carbon dioxide, trees are made of carbon, so we take carbon out of the air and store it in the bark, the leaves, and the wood, and that's one of the things as far as uh, looking at having wood products um, and having wood floors and post and beam building and all of the, uh, the new style techniques where we're really trying to uh, utilize wood as a major construction component. There's a ton of work being done that at the University of Massachusetts, one of the largest wood framed um, institutional buildings in the world is uh, the design building that was done at UMass. So they're using tool uh, forest products to tie up carbon for good in that building. We have the wood products lab with the forest service that is looking at the same thing. How do we innovatively bring to industry the use of wood products, okay? So also reducing home energy costs in a today's world of economic challenges, if you use your air conditioning less, or we can help you to, uh, um, you know, use a fan less or help you to uh, keep your home warmer in the summer, winter, um, that's a bonus. And so we can calculate those numbers. And this was just another study, reducing atmospheric dioxide. This is one in uh, Brattleboro, Vermont I did a couple of years ago, but looking at 10 inch diameter deciduous trees, a hundred of them move, remove five tons of CO2 a year. 100 trees remove 1,000 pounds of pollutants per year, including 400 pounds of ozone and 300 pounds of particulates. That's 110 inch diameter trees, and that's in Brattleboro. And then the hydrological benefits reducing stormwater. I'm sure you've seen all the intense storms we've had over the last few years, really flooding urbanized areas like downtown or you know the uh, town center in Lexington and um, places like Cambridge. And you know I've been stuck in some of those walking across. Um, in Cambridge, down at Harvard Square, just walking through six, seven inches of water that accumulate on the street. So all of this is 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 really critical. And how do we make cities um, um, more able to address these hydrologic effects? And then there's a couple more slides right here. I'll I'll just show you. But here in the Northeast, you can save up to thirty percent of annual air conditioning costs by placement of trees in these areas that I'm showing you here, plant trees over patios and in driveways, but shade the east and west windows, prune lower branches to prevent blocking the view, uh, plant on the west and northwest sides to prevent provide mid to late afternoon shade in most locations. So we can save 30% of our annual air conditioning costs and we can save in the winter on our heating costs, you'll see here, they can act as a windbreak and they can uh, reduce um, the wind up to 10 miles per hour and 15 miles an hour in other areas. So we can reduce up to 25% of our heating costs by strategically buffering our building from Northwest winds in, in the Northeast here that are the ones that blow the cold air into our house and hot air out of the house. And, and trees aren't the only thing we can do with insulation and other building uh, techniques we can combine and then save up to you know, 30 to 40% of our winter heating costs if um, done properly. And so here's just a quick summary of the energy, but trees cool the air, they act as a windbreak, they shade the buildings and they reduce energy demand, which helps us to keep the air cleaner and reduces um, the uh, effect of the, the redu uh, 
air uh, pollution in the air. So here's a couple more things that I put on the web resources for you here. There's a one pager that outlines a little bit about iTree. And then there's a, on the uh, flip sides of these are some of the uh, actual iTree uh, components that I'm gonna introduce to you right now. And so here's our website. It's called itreetools.org. And if you go to the website and I would go there live now, but we'll run out of time and I'm gonna go there live in a few minutes. Um, we have some tools and we call them easy, moderate, and more difficult to use, okay? And so I'm going to introduce you some of the easy ones and maybe some of the more difficult ones to use, but all of these tools are something that you could probably pick up and use tonight, okay, um, in various ways. And I, I really have some, I'm just going to get into them right now. Charlie, I don't know if it makes any sense. Do you have any pressing questions that, you, that somebody's asked and they're waving their hand like three times? Yeah, um, we've got several good questions, but I think they can all wait till the end. All right, so they're going to be patient. Um, and have people left the audience? See, I teach at the university, so I know what it is. I don't well, feel that more, more people keep logging on, so oh, that's, that's must that's be good. hearing you from outside too. All right, good, good, good. I'm I, I'm used to people walking out of my class at UMass. Most of the students aren't bashful. And I have a great relationship. I think a bunch of my students are actually on the call and some alumni, because I, you know, I'm not bashful when I try to have folks uh, come listen to iTree. But um, kids aren't bashful these days. They'll walk right out of class and go see you later, Dave. So um, I know what it is when I get boring. But let's keep going and we'll go and see what we're doing. So in the resources, I put together this guide last year, um, and I really like it because I did it. Um, and it's a quick guide to iTree. So I didn't want to, I'm not going to flip through it or anything like that, but I do have a copy of it up there on the resources for you. And every one of the softwares is pretty much explained why you want to use it, where you want to use it, or what kind of situation and things like that. So I think you'll recognize that picture. I believe that's taken from um, the um, Mount Auburn Cemetery, as you look back toward Boston, I might be wrong. It could be from the Arnold Arboretum. That picture was handed to me. Um, Nate, do you know where that was? It's from Mount Auburn. Nate worked at Mount Auburn as a student, um, as an intern. So he recognizes that view where he probably took many siestas looking out at it. Okay, so the first program I want to show you is a thing called Our Trees. And I just presented this to a bunch of uh, engineers in the Boston area. And they were blown away by it. And it's hard to impress engineers um, because they're, they're pretty smart people and they generally have uh, things figured out. So I wanted to show them this and they were like, wow, that's pretty cool. So I got that response from them. So maybe we'll get the same from you. So what it is, it's a, a program. If this clicks, you, you go ahead and you can put any community here in the country. Okay, and it will automatically, it'll just, I'll, I'll demonstrate this in a little while, but it pulls up a map that shows the whole geographic bounds of that city. So there's Boston, I just put that in yesterday. And then here's the results that come out. And immediately, I already know now that Boston has 16.96% tree canopy cover over 5,200 acres on 5,240 5, acres. Now, these are taken from um, using um, our um, aerial photos and our aerial imagery and our um, general, we, 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 uh, the Forest Service has a national database. So these numbers may not be as specific and exact as the city that went out and singly inventoried every tree, but we're looking here at a rough number. So now I can compare the percentage of tree canopy, 16.96% with Hartford, Connecticut, which is 26% tree canopy cover, and Springfield, Mass., which is 36% tree cover, with Fall River, which is 48% tree cover, with New York City, which is 23% tree cover, with Detroit, which is 16% tree cover, just as Boston is. Okay, so you can start to look at those numbers right away, but then I can also look here from a standpoint of the annual values and carbon dioxide uptake, how many pounds um, or tons, how many tons are uh, sequestered, 
stormwater mitigation. I can look at it in dollars and cents also. So we're converting the total benefits for this year in Boston trees, looking at all of these, including um, air pollution removal, runoff, carbon dioxide is $7,500,000 in value. And then carbon dioxide uptake is valued at $34 million a year. Okay, so these actually are numbers that you can use to quantify and to use on the carbon trading markets as a baseline number. And we're working with the EPA and several other federal agencies, as well as the uh, um, on the, um, the Commodities Exchange to look at how these numbers can be incorporated even more fully. And so you can also look at things like the population of a town. So we could uh, look at population 617,000. We can look at the income overview, the number of uh, uh, housing units, so this is beyond just the tree value. And now I can compare a city to a city. And I use this with planners and landscape architects all the time because they can quickly now, instead of having to go look up all this information. So there's Lexington, Mass. And here's what I found for Lexington. 50.79% tree canopy. Your value of your trees is $3,101,662 of benefits this year. Okay, you have 26% um, of the town is covered by impervious surfaces. And you can look at all of these numbers broken down by values. There's your population and they're under five. I didn't go to income because um, I didn't want to really realize, oops, I live in Springfield, so I didn't want to realize how poor I am. But um, the idea is we can look at that and who owns homes and the year that they're built and things like that. And I, I just think it's pretty cool. So you know what I'm going to do? I have a little time. I'm going to escape here and I'm going to go and see if I can share my other, uh, stop sharing. I just want to do this. I, this wasn't planned, but can you see my Google Google Chrome? Can somebody? No, you have to reshare your screen. You got to reshare. Sorry about that. Um, hang on. See, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have gone from this away from the script, but I, I am because I'm adventurous. Okay. So you, now you see it, right? Yes. So where do we, our trees right here? I'm going to put in, do we have folks here from Cambridge? Let's look up Cambridge. Comma MA. There it is. Okay. And then I can look at a satellite view. So you can start to get some ideas here. And I'm just showing this because I think it's pretty cool. So here's my results. And this just shows you if it's working properly tonight. There we go. Cambridge has 16% tree canopy cover, okay? Now, that seems kind of low to me. So, you know, I'm just going by what we have here. Uh, $400,000 in benefits. It's a lot smaller than some of the other cities I showed you. Carbon dioxide, all of that. But let's look at the community now. There's our population. Let's look at our income overview, per capita, median, who owns the homes and what kind of homes. What kind of uh, houses do we have? What's vacant percent and um, living alone? All these things. And how long have people lived there? So I just want to show you that. I think that's pretty, pretty, pretty cool that you can look that up in, in just a matter of seconds on any city in the country. Um, and I'm going to go back and share my screen. And I'm going to bring us back to our, did I lose it? Our PowerPoint. Yep, you're good. I back there. Okay, so that's a quick thing of what we call our trees. So the next one I'm going to show you is a thing called my tree. Okay, and I hope this is of interest to you, but my tree is another one that works on your smartphone, a tablet, on a laptop, or on a computer. And what it is, it's iTree on the go, and it's for individual multi or multiple trees. You know, I teach some kids, I teach at the university, but I also work with third graders on um, Thursday afternoons. And where it's called off to the great outdoors. And we use um, my tree to calculate trees on the schoolyard grounds. And I do, I've been doing this for a couple of years and it's pretty cool because the kids are only like, what is a third grader? Three plus, they're eight or nine years old. And it's so cool because they're, they're, wow, they start to learn. And what I'm hoping is you can go out to your own yard and find a tree and you put your address in and it actually will show up on a map, but I will go to this live in a second. And in this case here is a Chinese elm in excellent condition, 18 inch diameter and in the full sun. 
And then we ask when the house or building nearby was built, how far are you away from the building and what direction is it from the tree to the building? And then it actually comes up and here's four or five trees that I put in and it'll calculate those numbers for you. And it produces almost a tree nutrition label, I call it. It's like a box of Cheerios. And here's my nutrition label. Well, here it is. And oops, sorry. And so you get a label that looks just like this that you can print out and use um, in marketing and education and outreach. And we take these and I mount these on foam core and I hang them from trees in a lot of places that we work just to have people's awareness of, of what's going on. So my tree is a pretty cool thing. And I'll, I'll actually go there a second and show you this one because I think I can stop sharing and get there quick enough. So let's share um, this and I'll go back to Chrome and I'm going to go here and I'm going to go to, okay. And I'm going to go now to um, my tree right there. There it is. Oops. I'm going to go to my tree and I'm going to put in an address. I'm going to put in 40 Lincoln Street, Springfield, MA. That's across the street from where I am now. I'm in this building right over here. I'm in here right now. This is part of the Springfield Army, but there's 40 Lincoln Street and I can zoom in. So I'm going to move this tree to right there. So now the tree's in front of the building. And I'm going to describe my tree, and I know what it is. It's a sugar maple. Oops. And I know that it is 24 inches in diameter. Okay. And it's in excellent condition. It's in the full sun, and it's within 60 feet of a building. And the building was built before 50 it was actually built in the 1800s 1749 59 was when the armory was started i select the distance and it's zero to 19 feet because it's right in front of the building and then the that's looking northwest okay from the tree to the building and here's my results that i'm going to get and the idea is you can do this on the fly right in your smartphone right out in the field and here's my number and i can add a new tree or i can just get my number right here but over 20 years, this tree is providing us $900 in benefits, and here it is broken out. And if I want to find out what it's providing today, well, it's providing $44 in benefits a year. And that shows what it's doing as far as carbon storage uptake, um, the, the stormwater mitigation, avoided energy emissions, things like that. So that's just a simple way that you can do it. You can look at 20 years, or you can look at it today. So that's another one that I think you uh, actually can use and pick up and run with it. And so let's see if I can get back to here and share my other screen. Go back to PowerPoint right here. And the next slide I want to show you is another one called iTree Design. Okay, I'm just dumping these on you, but you have time for questions in a couple minutes. So iTree Design is a more enhanced way to do this same kind of calculation. What you do is you trace your building. And then you're going to place trees around it that exist or are proposed. And then you're able to calculate those numbers. So I work a lot with landscape architects that have no trees on a site. And I say, oh, let's plant trees and show the owner of the building or the developer the value of what these trees are going to do. And then that way they can actually get trees planted where sometimes they might not otherwise be able to. Okay, now if I'm also have to remove a, a bunch of trees because of construction, I can put a value on those just by doing this. So I can either look at proposed or I can look at, at, at uh, future scenarios. And this is just a school that I did um, in Springfield and we went across and we identified every tree. I actually went out there with a student or a couple students and they recorded the location of each tree right on a, um, a tablet. And we're able to uh, place the trees and the type of tree. And you're then able to calculate some numbers just by doing this. And so what it does is it, it gives you the overall benefits, okay? And this these trees here at the uh, Glenwood Elementary, $1,800 in the current year. We could also look at, on the left tab here, we can look at future years. And I can project ahead as far as I want up to 99 years. 
I can look at the total between now and whatever projected year would be and, and the year to date from when the tree was two inches in diameter. And I can look at uh, overall benefits with air quality and stormwater, winter savings, summer savings. I can look at stormwater, um, energy, energy in, in BTUs and um, um, amount of uh, kilowatt hours that are saved, air quality and carbon dioxide. So you get all those answers and then you can actually look at them and oops, let's go back, sorry. And you can pull these up. So here's an actual, and it's sort of an inventory tool that you can use if you're doing a small park, you're doing a small collection of trees. This could be of real value to you. And, and I use this, my students use this all the time. And you know, I know we use this with a lot of tree um, uh, groups across the country and around the world um, that we go out and we do uh, projects that can, and, and I know in Bangladesh, they were using this as their only tool that they had for tree inventory because they're not, they don't have the, the funding to get sophisticated programs that we have for archiving and management. So we've been working with them on this. And then you can take it all and you can put it into a nice little report. And so we did two schools in Springfield that I did with my students a while ago. And, and, and they put all the numbers together and we just report out. We have information that then tells a story instead of, oh, those trees look nice in front of the school. Well, now we can actually put a number on the trees. Here's another one. Um, that you can look at. This is a pretty cool one. This is called I Tree Canopy. And what I Tree Canopy is, you pull up any city and there's this, we pull up a state. And then from there you go to a city. And in this case here, you can then zoom in and it zooms and it takes random spots. Like this one here is a tree on the top. This one here is a roadway. And then you can report out when you're done. I'll give you some answers here, but you get these random points there's Lexington. I just put Lexington in yesterday to see, and it automatically pulls that up. And so you could do this in about one hour. We could have a, a canopy report. I just did Northampton Mass the other day for uh, Rich, Rich Persoletti, the tree warden. He had a question. I said, let's just do the eye tree canopy. And we did it in 45 minutes. But it pulls up in there. I think it's at Hanscom Air Force Base. There's a um, just uh, impervious surface. And here's an example of one we did in Holyoke, Massachusetts. So you see, we take, we go and we get about 500 random points just by clicking. And then we identify them and we get answers like this. What percent tree cover do we have? And what percent water and impervious buildings and impervious roadways? So you start to get things. And then you can produce some reports that look like this. So you have here land cover and percentages as well as uh, square miles. Then you can look here and we can see in, in Holyoke, we have 26.2% um, tree cover, um, the carbon storage, the value, carbon benefits, air pollution. Um, you can go all the way down to sulfur dioxide. The totals are all spelled for you. And this happens instantaneously. And then again, down below is the hydrological benefits of uh, how much avoid the runoff, how much evaporation and interception and things like that, transpiration. And so I'm gonna go and escape out of here for another second. And I'm gonna show you this in person. And then we are probably only have about five minutes left, but I think we've gotten to most of the places that we needed to go to have you be dangerous, um, which is exciting for me that we actually got in here. So let's see if I can get back to my, um, I wanna share my Chrome. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back here because I'm going to go to iTree Tools because that's the easiest way for me. And I'm going to go back and I want to show you um, iTree Canopy, which I just showed you. And I'm going to go here and it gives you a little bit. You can let me see if I can view this in, in uh, actual size. There it is. OK, so um, you can see here and it just goes through some things. But let's get started. And so I'm going to pick. Let's see. Um, well, the easiest way for me to do is show you and launch the example project. And so what I'm going to do, it's going to pull up Hartford, Connecticut. OK, so there's Hartford and there's the map of all the locations I have. And here's my results and I can pull up the report. But let's just pretend I'm going to go to the end here. I have 500 points. So let's go and add another point and show you how this works. So you just sit there pour yourself an iced tea, 
and do 500 points. So what do you think that point is? It's just catching the edge of that canopy. So I'm gonna go and call it a tree or a shrub. And then I'm gonna to go to my next point. And I know that's a tree or a shrub. And then I'm gonna to go to one more and I'll show you. And here, the point right here is up on the corner of the building here. So I'm gonna call that an impervious building. And so now I'm gonna to go to save and I can save my project and I can save it here so I can go back. If I only did 300 points, I can go back later and add the other 200. But let's just click report here. And here's our report is produced. So you have a little map there that sort of shows you, I can look at the satellite view so you can get it in perspective. Here's our land cover and it's interactive. Okay, so you can look and see the numbers right there. We get this reporting here. There's the carbon storage. There's our tree benefits, air pollution. And then we have the hydrological. So all of that, and this can be printed out, saved as a PDF, and then you're good to go. But this information that you have is, is pretty phenomenal. And I'll quickly, Nate, how much time do we have? Three minutes? Okay, so I'm gonna go back to Canopy. Oops, sorry. I'm gonna go back to Canopy. I'm gonna go get started. And I'm gonna go here to a new project. And I'm gonna start over. I'm going to say OK, and I'm going to go to get started here. And so now I have a town. Let's put in Lexington. OK, there's Lexington Naw. And so if I go here, and if I had GIS, we can load a, uh, a shape file in here. But I have all these boundaries. So let's just click on census places and see if Lexington shows up. So there's Lexington. And I could also look by census blocks and other ways to look at this. I can look at a whole variety of other things. But let's just do this. And if I only want to do part of my town, I can draw my own boundary. So if you have a town that um, has certain areas that are all forested, I can keep those out of the equation just by removing them or not adding them in. So you can adjust this and, and modify it. But let's just go here to next. And then it's going to ask me here, I'm going to, these are the cover classes that we have that are going to identify, and I can go here and do this. So I can just identify where a tree is or other surfaces, but while I'm doing this, I might as well find out what the other things going on are. So you, and you can add or subtract to these and edit and add your own. And then what you do here, we're going to go to the U.S. And then all I do is go to Massachusetts. And then I go, which county are we in over there? Are we in, I'm going to guess. That's probably a bad guess. That's those that I don't know. Middlesex State. There we go. All right. And then I go over here and I click urban. I'm breezing through this, but we have all the instructions. All of the guidebooks are all in there. And so it just pulls up these numbers that are populated based on um, standard values that we have based on um, the, the rates of carbon storage removal, things like that. And then you just go to next and then you're ready to go. So now if you look, you'll see it's barely outlined here, but I'm gonna go to my first spot and there it is on Waltham Street. And I'm looking for my little square. Where is it? Nate, do you see it? Oh, there it is. It's right there where my paw is. And so on that one, it's going to be a roadway. So I'm just going to go here, impervious road. I'm going to save it. And then let's go to the next one. Don't forget to take out my trash can, Alexis says. So today must be trash night. That's a building. So that's going to be a building. And then I'm going to do one more. And this ends up being solar panels right on the edge of this building here. So I'm going to report it out as a building. And so I just sit, I drink my iced tea, and I just save that. And then I save my project. After, and when I get 500 points, I can click on report, and I'll have my report. As you go through it, because it's all based on, um, uh, on statistics, and these are uh, confidence intervals and... Um, the ability to look at these numbers, these 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 um, bar graphs have to come down smaller to show that the uh, standard uh, deviation is small enough to be statistically accurate. So everything's grounded in good science. So last thing, and I'm going to do one more thing, and I'm going to put this last slide up. 
while we go over to the questions, because I have several other programs that we won't talk about right now, but I wanted to give you the ones that I thought were the um, the coolest, the best, and the brightest. So let's, and we only have an hour. Now, uh, can you see that? Yes, yes. And let me uh, escape out of here, and I just want to get down to my, how do I do this? Hang on one sec. I hit escape. I open this up, and I want to get down to the end to put up the address for you. Okay. And then, can you see that? Do you see the picture down top? Oh. Hang on, everybody. Sorry. Why didn't I share my screen? There you go. We're back in Lexington. You see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I wanted you to write that down, that address again. I just want to put that up there. Plus, I will also uh, send it out in uh, the recap email. Okay. Sweet. Thanks, man. And then we have itreetools.org and then my office, um, UNRI. And I'm part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, U.S. Forest Service. So I just want to make sure you saw that one um, and keep it up there. But, Charlie, you want to, uh, it's just eight o'clock now. I know you've been listening to me uh, ramble and and talk, and I'm never at a loss for words, but um, why don't we uh, shut off the screen here and you can see my face and I'll try to answer some questions. Is that okay? Uh, that sounds perfect, Dave. Thank I you. To, and I do have to wake up Nate, so hang on one second. <laughs> Nate, are you awake? Oh, Nate went to the, um, Nate's an arborist in the city of Springfield and uh, works very hard with them and with the whole team in Sprinkle, and that's where I live. But um, they went; the whole team went down today to the Mass Tree Wardens and Foresters Association had their annual conference yesterday and today. So, I think you're sick of listening to people talking about new cool stuff. So, but Charlie, you got some questions for me? I, I do, Dave. Let me say that was wonderful. Um, you uh, took us on quite a tour of iTree and concepts related to it. My head is swimming, and I suspect many in our audiences as well. But you've given us the tools where we can go back and, and learn the details and and uh, practice with iTree and, and learn something. And, um, and also, uh, my phone number will be in there. So folks, Charlie, you know how it is. You text me and I get back to you. That's yep. the best way. Email is uh, not- Doesn't dice. work so well. Well, it's just because, <laughs> you know, you always yeah, have- your you're phone. busy. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. feel free anybody that was on the call to bother me. I don't- That's very nice of you, Dave. Thank uh, you. Yeah, thank you salary and when you pay on the 15th of april every year um so we have a number of good questions and uh, let's see how many we can get through in the next half hour um so one that came up a couple of times um you know i tree uh, attempts to quantify the benefits associated with uh carbon sequestration stormwater and air pollution but yeah. trees do more than those three things yeah. Um, and particularly in terms of biodiversity uh, and in terms of um, mental health and well-being. Yes. W what do you have to say? To, I have to, to say that. that's such a critical more uh, and can be of more value than the ecosystem services. And we found that out during COVID of people's connection with mental health, reducing anxiety, reducing depression, reducing a variety of those issues, and then looking at you know, we're just starting our research right now on public health and mental health is just starting over the last two years with our Forest Service research teams and especially working with our uh, university partners. So we're just moving down um, that path right now. So it's difficult to quantify. You know, we can look at hospitalization, emergency room, uh, things that we're looking at now for asthma. But for mental health, that's a, a tough thing to put a dollar value on. I mean, a quantifiable number. Okay, so how many people are were able to reduce, you know, you uh, uh, prescription Rx, outdoor Rx. I don't know if you're familiar where the doctor will hand you a prescription and say, go outside for two hours every third day or an hour, or 10 minutes or whatever that might be. So the, the medical world, we realize it, but it's the... To quantify it is very, very, very difficult. So we're just starting that now. The easiest one for us to do is um, emergency room visits for asthma in youth. And that's where a lot of our focus is going. And then also looking at um, 
uh, end of life issues for elderly folks. We're also looking, um, we have uh, uh, Jeffrey Donovan and a few other research scientists are looking at that, that if you're in a nursing home and you're looking out over green space, are you gonna live longer than somebody who's not looking at that same view? And it's kind of interesting because, you know, we know we can reduce hospitalization rates by looking at views of green space and things like that. And that's why we have rooftop gardens on all the new hospitals. And so people not only can get out in, in those, but look at them from the rooms and all of the rooms look down on those. So yes, we know we can only, right now we're quantifying what we can quantify. Um, but we also know wildlife habitat. We're adding a new component in now that's looking at birds. And it's gonna say, okay, so you have these trees and what kind of birds are attracted to those and is that adding to biodiversity there? So that's one of the components, but um, it, it, we're, we know there's a lot of work ahead and that's why come to work with the Forest Service and go to school and stay and get your master's and then come work with us because we're hiring like crazy um, scientists and social scientists. We're not really hiring foresters anymore. We're hiring folks that are, you know, because we, we live in urbanized areas. And so there, there's a ton of work. And if anyone's interested in that, I'd be happy to introduce them to some folks that could send them down a career path. And especially kids from the inner city, you know, we're working with folks, you know, I'm working with Power Core Boston, trying to get some of those kids to decide they want to go to college, but more importantly, maybe come and do an internship with the Forest Service or a Pathways Program. But so Charlie, the answer to that is we know we got a ton of work to do. I'm an old man, so I'll be leaving eventually. And we need young people to come in and keep helping us with this. But because this is folks like you say this is important and you've done that to not only um, through some interview process and listening sessions and talking to folks that have reached out to Congress to tell us iTree is pretty cool. So the chief of the Forest Service, my, my big boss, um, is fully aware. Um, I think we. Uh, Matt, is is it Dave that's frozen or am I? Oh, here he's, he's back. back. He's yeah. back. Okay, we lost you for just a second there, Dave. But well, let me ask you another question. Um, someone asked, how do trees impact our groundwater resources? Okay, and that's what we have a uh, iTree Hydro in here. Mm -hmm. and one of the cool things with that is, I mean, trees certainly impact um, groundwater re recharge and underground aquifers and our own reservoirs and streams and rivers and things like that. But we can actually calculate with iTree Hydro, if I have say 400 acres in a, in a watershed, if I take out 110 of those acres because I had to build a new school there, what does that do? And how many um, you know millions of gallons are taken out of the hydrological cycle? And what that means from a dollar standpoint, we can actually calculate that using iTree Hydro. This, on the other side, I can say, okay, so I have an unused parking lots out at Shoppers World or whatever the heck's in Framingham. And today, none of those parking lots are always filled because we don't use as many cars as we used to and things. What if I take 40 acres of the 400 acres of parking and turn that into a forest? How can that be calculated? And we use iTree Hydro for that. And um, we're actually doing a pretty cool project right here in Springfield with the Harvard Graduate School of Design. We have a research team here that's working for three years um, looking at roadway networks in Springfield. And we're looking at uh, taking up half of the asphalt and turning those into forests. But one of the big things with that is how does that affect? We have some um, hydrologists and some environmental engineers working um, out of Cambridge with us, and they're calculating how much more water is recharged into the groundwater supply here. And that's by removing all that asphalt. So it's the same thing here. We can use iTree Hydro, and that's what we're using to calculate that. So mm -hmm. iTree Hydro, um, we know trees are very important to the hydrological process, to underground aquifers, to reservoirs, rivers, and streams. And we can calculate that using iTree Hydro. I just didn't get to that in iTree Eco, and some of the other ones <laughs> you can get lost with. I showed you the easiest uh, ones that you can use and really I, I think are most applicable to the current things that you folks might do here. Yeah. Well, another time we'll do a four-hour seminar and then you can get all that in. 
Well, you're gonna <laughs> you look where am I? Here you go. You can't see it. It's a it's a, you'll be getting this is gonna be pretty cool. We're having our iTree online learning for the 23. We have uh, live webinars, then we have online recorded sessions, and then we have a web resource library. So I'm gonna send this over to what I sent to Matt tomorrow. So you'll have a link to go to that. Yeah. Um, and that's Great. coming up. So, but you can join us. We have um, 11 uh, seminars set up for this year. So, but Fabulous. yeah. Fabulous. Okay, so another uh, question. It comes from a Lexington resident about a project here in town, but I know this dynamic is playing out across the state. Um, she writes, a company wants to cut down 800 trees in Lexington to install solar panels to generate electricity. How do we calculate the value of the trees versus that of the energy to be generated? You know, what can I tree? Yeah, so they're going to they're going to give you how much electricity they're going to generate. So they're going to have some number and say, get these 800, the space where the 800 trees were, is it say eight or 400? Uh, 800. 800. So that square is going to have some quantifiable number that's going to generate X number of kilowatt hours and there's a dollar value. So what we can do is we can then go in and we can use um, iTree Design or iTree Canopy and actually calculate that area and it'll give us the number of the trees, the value that those trees provide us right now. And we can just give that number and say, you're going to be losing these $22,000 of benefits each year. And over the next 10 years, you're going to be losing, you know, $450,000. So you can compare and contrast the two of those. But that's what um, you could either use Canopy or you could use um, uh, Design to do that. And mm -hmm. uh, that would help help you to be able to calculate that. And yeah. the other one I didn't get into, we could also do that with a thing called iTree Eco. iTree Eco, if you have time, would require you to go out and do some actual on the ground sampling. And that would give you your most accurate number by going out and visiting those 800 trees. And we'd do a sample of them and then we'd have their average size, diameter and type and condition. And then we'd have even more accurate numbers. But yes, iTree can be applied perfect for that situation. We do it all the time. Great, thank you. Um, Lisa writes, I used iTree in a community project. We used the, um, the iTree MyTree tool and found the value of over 100 town trees. Some of the trees showed a negative value. Um, is that to be expected? Is that a, yeah, a you problem could, with it? You'd have a tree that can block, it generally happens with the winter savings, it will block the sun from hitting the house and that solar receipt doesn't warm up the house or doesn't go through the windows and heat up things in the house. It's kind of cool because if you have, depends what species tree it is. Okay, so a thinly um, branched tree will let more sunlight in even if it's blocking the building. But suppose I have a pin oak that has a dense canopy and it sometimes even keeps their leaves on it. But just look at the branching. Try to look through a pin oak tree in the middle of the winter and you can't. So if I have that tree on the south side of my building, it's going to block the sun and I can't let the sun get in there. And so that's where that negative number comes from. And that's why it's costing you money to have trees around that house or building. And keep in mind, when you use my tree, you're going to have the distance away from the house and then the direction of the tree to the building. And that shows you where your sun, um, you know, solar receipt comes from. But I, I couldn't get over it at the beginning when we were starting to do iTree because we used to get a lot of negative numbers. People go, this thing is useless. I'm getting negative numbers. Well, no, you're not. You're getting the real numbers. And you should know now, maybe that's the one tree you want to cut down and go plant five more somewhere that are going to benefit you. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. those numbers come from. Yeah, that's, good. That's pretty good. cool that you're using, Interesting. using my tree. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. To hear that. I think there'll be a lot more after tonight. Um, Dave, uh, someone writes, is there a way to look at particular areas of cities, you know, neighborhoods or environmental justice areas? Or, yeah. or, or are you limited to just uh, municipal boundaries? No. I mean, you saw at the beginning on Canopy, I can pull up by U.S. Census blocks. So I could start looking at census blocks. And we have another tool in here. I don't want to confuse folks, but you know, from an environmental justice standpoint, we have a, a, a the latest tool we have is called iTree Landscape. 
And if anyone wants to use that or wants a primer on how to use it, it's a really powerful tool that I work with and use it with my students to look at census blocks. But I just had uh, four University of Massachusetts second year medical students look at an environmental justice, three environmental justice neighborhoods in Springfield, just zoomed in on them. And then they went to the census blocks, which were the lowest, the the poorest of those those areas, and were able to then look at the tree canopy. And they did the relationship of the least trees are in the poorest areas, which is pretty common. But then they were also looking at the environmental health benefits that the trees provide, and then looking at the disparity between the environmental justice neighborhoods and some of the more affluent neighborhoods. And actually, they went out and did another community um, Long Meadow, which is pretty affluent next door to Springfield, and it's sort of the uh, juxtaposition of what Springfield has. So yes, you can target it by uh, either drawing in an area or pulling up the census box, which are preloaded into these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, someone writes, how exactly do you calculate the amount of shade and wind coverage a tree provides to residential housing? And specifically, do the current studies apply to single family housing or can it be applied to large housing complexes as well? Yeah. So right now it's applied to single family housing of okay. one story <laughs> or up to two stories. Our newest version we're looking at now is we're gonna be able to tell are those buildings brick, are they steel framed or are they wood framed and how many stories do you have? So we're looking at going up to about six stories because that's what we can calculate. And those are pretty common in most of our our cities. Um, you know, you're not going to be going into downtown uh, Boston and getting a you know a 30 story building or things like that. But um, at that point, you're probably using some other tools to start to estimate the values. Um, right, right. Good. Yeah, because uh, that isn't the only thing out there. You can, you know, uh, there's a million ways to skin a cat. In fact, there's a cat walking around I see in your office. <laughs> this is Monty, and for some reason he. He's a Zoom bomber. He anytime I get on Zoom, uh, he tries to crash the party. Yeah, there's no, that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, are there any tools to determine tree species? Someone writes. What if I have a maple, but I don't specifically know which which species? And if it happens to be a Norway maple, does I tree discount the value? It won't discount the value because it's an invasive. If it's Norway maple, no. Um, but and we do have invasive. You know, like we have Norway maples in the database because they're, you know, it's a tree that is prominent. So, um, but we we do, the only tool we have, um, Nate, what's the name of the program we use? Picture This. Have you ever heard of Picture This? Oh, yes. Sure. Yep. That's what I use with my students and with trainings that we do. Um, I don't think... Yeah, I, I don't have a Forest Service iPhone, but we can't put it on our Forest Service smartphones because it's um, it was developed in China, so uh, we can't use that. Hmm. This hmm. is kind of interesting. But the point is, that's how I do that. But yeah. We do have a thing called, this is crazy, you're going to laugh, but we have a thing called iTree Species, and iTree Species looks at uh, public health, and it looks at volatile organics, uh, um, particulate, sodium dioxide, sulfur dioxide. It looks at what tree absorbs more of those uh, gases or, or particulates and how that all relates. So you put in uh, a tree. Well, the way we, the, the recent one that I just did was for the city of Springfield to have a new plant palette developed for their city forester. And he gave me a list of trees that they use here. And we gave them the new list, which are trees that are from zero to 20 feet 20 to 40 and 40 foot and beyond that provide the most benefits from a public health standpoint. And most of those are respiratory that we calculate and I tree species does that for you. I actually have a, a person has been, um, I, I, I get some nursing students come in our class because we, we're looking big at you now the relationship between public health and trees. So I've somehow attracted nursing students and some folks from public health at, at UMass when I teach my eye tree class in the spring and they use my trees, eye tree species as one of the key things for their part of their research where other kids that are landscape architects might use eye tree design, but the public health people use um, eye tree species. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, good. And we have public policy and, you know, with um, I tree landscape and environmental justice. So we, we use, you know, whatever tool is appropriate. Yeah, yeah. If you go to the website, that's where you're really going to see um, all the tools spelled out for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good, thank you. Um, and this relates to that, I guess, then. Um, how is iTree being used by communities today? I think it's a great tool, the, the writer um, says, and would love to pass on your information to appropriate town departments. It's done, it, the way it spreads is by things like this. I just did the, a, I did a workshop in Lemonster in November. It was the mass tree steward training. And then this, you know, this one here, but I, I, I make myself available to any community that wants me. I, I go to a lot of commissions and I present to conservation commissions and planning boards and things like that. And with Zoom, it's really easy, but I have to have a succinct message based on that particular community. You know, here we had the luxury of an hour, but I usually get 15 minutes and have to sell it out. So if somebody's interested in having us or me, and I know I have some Forest Service colleagues on here, um, you know, they might be interested in helping too. We can put together a short presentation. We can even record those that they could distribute to their members, and then we can come in for a Q&A. That's the other way we do it. Sometimes I do a little recording send it out, they give it to their members at one meeting, and then the next meeting I come in and do the Q&A. And, mm -hmm. so, and, and do you hear, is iTree being used mostly by um, citizens and residents or being used by sta town staff? and A wide variety. That's what we just did. We had a series of listening sessions this past uh, spring, and we find that there's a, a good chunk of municipal managers that are involved in green space management use it but then we also find that we have groups of planning uh planning departments that use it we also have um the researchers at um various levels in in universities and colleges use it and then uh, uh, you know the, the 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 friends of uh hall's pond or whatever the community group would be they would use it and we do a ton of work and then in the schools the schools use it a lot and the uh you know k through 12 it, it's used a ton there too so it's not and in landscape architects and engineers civil engineers as well as uh, environmental engineers are all are using it more and more and more and that's why i keep trying to present to to folks like that you know i, I like i said i somehow i get a little respect from them because i say i have a master's in landscape architecture and i worked for a big landscape architecture firm in boston so i can talk that language and and they listen and they go oh this is pretty cool and you know i when an engineer or an architect or something says oh this is pretty cool you know that they're interested otherwise they, they just don't say anything and they hit pause and the recording and they just leave so <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's being used by a wide variety of folks and folks like you, um, you know, Charlie, you're, you're a, a citizen advocate. You're okay. trying to make, um, you know, change in, in, in Lexington. You're trying to educate the public. You're involved in the other community. I'm so happy to see you had, you know, um, in Bedford and all the other cities. I don't have them in front of me, but, um, you know, joining you to cross promote, but cross pollinate this and, so if, if a few of you guys want to get together um, and we do a, a little workshop, be happy to do it. Great. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. I know um, the Boston metro area. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, adverse to traveling. Um, a couple of people have remarked uh, about the tendency of developers to clear cut a lot yeah. um, before building. And you must be, we're seeing that in, in many of the suburbs around us. Um, I'm sure you're hearing about that uh, around. How can people use iTree um, to sort of battle that tendency? Yeah, to battle that and show them that, look, at you just can't, well, you can put a dollar value on it. I'm not adverse to removing trees and cutting them down as long as there's some compensation paid. And, you know, I know if we use the CTLA method, the numbers get too crazy. I don't have $40 million to clear those 800 trees. But by using iTree, we might have a more realistic number of, you know, $86,000 in annual and, and fees. And maybe the solar company will be able to 
get you that 86,000 to be used in a trust or whatever it might be. So you need to be realistic and that, but we can give you the I tree will give you that ammunition to really seek that compensation because you know there's nothing worse than losing trees in a community, but we see it all the time. And, you know, it's, you know, it's just on one end, you're planting trees. And on the other end, we're removing trees. And, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I like to uh, reach some kind of a compromise between everybody. And remember developers, they'll put it into the cost of what they're developing. So why not seek that funding from them? It's not like you're stealing money from them. They're more than happy to do it to advance their project. Now, keep in mind, the trees aren't the only component of these things, you know, how politics and all the other things. So we just given you some really science, science. If I can give you science and then you have that in your, you know, your, your, your toolbox, and then you decide to fight what battle you think is most appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, just remember some battles can't be won and others yep. can be won. Like, yep. you know. You pick and choose I your battles. Know. You know, we made a big mistake at the beginning with iTree when Apple approached us. They, You know, we have a trademark office at the Forest Service in Washington because we own Smokey the Bear. And he makes yep. a lot of money for us. And we also own Woodsy the Owl and, and he or she, they're, they're nondescript. But they make a lot of money for us. So we missed the boat when Apple came and said, yeah, you got to stop. And then we decided to put the dash in. But that's when we should have partnered with Apple at that time. Mm -hmm. Hey, do you want to be part of this thing that was emerging? Yeah. And that's right when the first iPhone came out. That's where you know I, I saw that that might be pretty popular. And that's why I had the I tree with the small I. And a lot of people go, what are you doing now? <laughs> I was lucky. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I've had a lot of other failures, but that one was one of the successes. So um, we're approaching the witching hour. Um, one last question, and I'm sorry to everyone whose questions we we won't get to, um, but someone asks um, whether the Forest Service is using iTree outside of urban areas, and when it comes to forest management of national forests and decisions about cutting and and so forth, you know, um, does it? Do you use iTree or are there other tools to sort of account for the health of the forest, climate resilience, successional habitat, sort of that whole suite of issues? We have a whole set of tools that we use on our Forest Service lands, okay? But if we're working with, say, the state of Massachusetts and we're looking at um, small parcels of DCR, Department of Conservation and Recreation land, we'll use iTree. And so we are using it at that level with the Forest Service, but on our bigger forest stands that are, um, you know, cut for production, because uh, we're Department of Agriculture, which means we're raising crops that we harvest. And so we have a bunch of other tools that look at that, but not so much the uh, environmental benefits, but the dollars and cents from an economic standpoint. But iTree can be used on a large scale. We can we could use it on the whole state of Massachusetts if you wanted. And um, in fact, when you, my boss, my former boss, Dave Nowak, who helped develop, I, or he's the godfather, um, and I've been working with him for 100 years, and he always tells me, Dave, iTree is not only an urban tool. You got to remember, it's for suburban landscapes like we're talking about and forested landscapes. But because I'm an urban guy and I live in the city and that's what I love, I'm always on the urban side. So if yeah. you put me in the woods and spin me around, I'll get lost unless I can find a street sign. And, uh, oh, great. Well, Dave, this has been wonderful. Um, we have learned so much. Uh, we'll all look forward to seeing the, the uh, list of resources that Matt will uh, send on to us. And we've got a lot more learning ahead of us um, with those to, to guide us. So thank you very much for taking the time to, to share with us tonight. And uh, I'll thank everyone for joining us tonight. And at this point, I will pass it back to Matt to sign off. And just before you go, thank you very much. Thanks for your attendance, everybody. But um, Matt and Charlie, thanks for the invite. Um, we can't bring the word out unless we're invited. So thank yeah. you so much. Well, our pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely, our pleasure. And I uh, just want to also say thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you, David. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, all the partner organizations as well. This event was recorded and will be on the Cary Library YouTube page in the next coming days, and you'll receive a recap email uh, with some information, as they said. So thank you, everyone.
Have a good night. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you.